This is Metal Mike, and this is a great one, man. Ryan and I do our 15 favorite hair metal songs that are covers. It's a lot of fun, and there's a lot of music education going on, so check it out. Well, Ryan, welcome back to the 80s Glam Metal Cast, buddy. Well, thank you. Good to be back. Well, this is going to be a good one, man. We're going to talk about some hair metal cover songs. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking these aren't going to be the, the typical ones that everybody knows. Like, you know, we all know Come On, Feel the Noise, and Mama, We're All Crazy Now, Smoking in the Boys' Room, but I think these, uh, this, these 15 will be a little deeper than that. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's a really cool topic. I know that I left off a lot of the Giants, <laughs> uh-huh. and I'm sure you did too, but, um, yeah, there might be a couple in there. <laughs> oh yeah, I got. I mean, I got a mixed bag. I think the crazy thing is two things that I got to say before we start. First of all, you don't even realize how many there are until you start digging through your mind and you know, and then look at oh, all different yeah. lists, and you're like, wow, I can't believe how many uh, cover songs there were, especially throughout the '80s. And then secondly, man, I just have to say that Spotify is a super creepy program because what would happen was, if once I listened to like a few of the covers. All of a sudden, and then I'd be writing my thoughts about what, you know the different songs. All of a sudden, Spotify's queuing up another one that's on my list, and I didn't even search it. <laughs> so I'm like, what? "Oh wow!" You know, so it just it must be like the the AI, and it knows that like you're look, you know, it must know the cover songs by the hair model bands, and it just keeps pumping them onto your list. And it was like, "Wow, that was I thought that was super creepy." Yeah, totally creeping in, and yeah, it's <laughs> such an interesting the, this whole topic of, of cover songs. It's like such a make or break for so many of these bands you know so like they either had like their biggest hit or some of them totally bombed yeah and so it's like a big time topic but uh i also noticed that like doing all this research like the appreciation i have for the versions that we're discussing like thank god they recorded them differently like the way they are how i know them as covers versus the original and and, like that that happened on uh, nearly like every single one Kind of like when, you know, you hear a uh, Kickstart My Heart demo and then you hear the real thing and you're like, oh, thank God they changed that. <laughs> right. And that's, so, for yeah. me, there was a, like once I did some research, I was kind of shocked at where some how, how far back some of these songs go, like the true origins. Because some of these songs have been covered multiple times, at least some of the ones on my list. So it is pretty totally. wild to see these uh, the history of these tunes. But hey, man, let's just jump in. Let's hear what your 15 is. Okay, number 15, I got Tiger Tails, Peace Cells. So, <laughs> That's uh, a great one. <laughs> That's a great one. Yeah, they got a, it's the Megadeth cover from 1986, and then Tiger Tails released it on their 91 album called Bonsai, which was kind of like a, a remix, B-side, greatest hits type CD they put out. Um, really cool album. Um, we've talked you know, about this before. I'm not the, the hugest Megadeth fan. I got like a few of their albums. But I really do like it when Tiger Tails kind of turns it up a notch and mm-hmm. does. Uh, they did Creeping Death and they did Peace Cells yep. on this album. So it was kind of a coin flip for me. But I just I really like the bass intro on this song uh, as opposed to the Metallica song. But um, really cool. They did a great job. And like I said, when Tiger Tails kind of kicks it up a notch, they, they, they do a really good job of like hard stuff. So yeah, that's what 15 is. That's a great pick. You know, and, and I never thought that when I've heard those two versions that they were like earth shattering but i think it's just the the novelty here it is this gl- super 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 glammy band is doing a megadeth song or a metallica song and they're doing it well so i just think it's the novelty that is so cool uh, of both of those covers yep exactly all right number 15 <laughs> Uh, Pretty Boy Floyd. It's a it's a cover of Motley Crue's song from 1981. But I think what's cool about this one for me is that you know I I I had read about Toast of the Town and Stick to Your Guns, but I never heard either of them because it wasn't like today where I could just go onto YouTube and check it out. You know, like those were yeah. like, you had to have bought those singles like back in L.A. or something. I don't know. You, you there was no way you were really going to hear those tracks uh, in the in the later 80s. So. It was cool that Pretty Boy Floyd did it. Now, if I had to judge which version I like better, I probably like Motley Crue's better. It's just, I don't know, it's just cooler, you know what I mean? It's original, but but Pretty Boy Floyd's is pretty good. I think Pretty Boy Floyd's is faster, 
Uh, it's a little heavier, but I, I think it's overproduced because I think with most of the ones that I did, I listened to the original and the and the cover of it, and I would say that maybe that track is a little overproduced where Motley's is a little bit more straightforward and raw, but still cool. I mean, Steve uh, Summers is, you know, he's basically a dead ringer vocally for, you know, Vince Neil. So it's, it's pretty, yeah. it's pretty similar, but yeah, it's cool. And it's just got that sentimental value because like, that's, that's how I heard that song first. That's cool. And I knew that we would come up with different songs and I, it triggered my memory and hopefully I'll trigger yours. And this is exactly that example. Cause we had talked about the song on the, um, Mick Mars episode yep. of, it being so relevant in 89 and sounding so current, you know, so ahead of its time in 81. So, uh, great pick. Awesome. Let's hear your 14. Okay, 14, I'm going back to Shy, the band Shy, and they did uh, It's Only Rock and Roll by the Stones, and that was a 1974, yeah, 1974 hit for them, and they... Shy recorded it in 94 on that album I like so much from 94 called Welcome to the Madhouse. So uh, this is like the epitome of how to alter and update a song, a cover song for me. Like, I, I like the Stones, but I don't, you know, I don't like listen to them on a routine basis. But I really, really like this version. And they did such a good, updated, cool version of the song. And the music video is also really cool for 94. It's very 80s-ish and they do a lot of cool shit in that video. But you know, I, I, I've always preached this album, Welcome to the Madhouse, and this is actually one of the really strong tracks on this album amongst their originals. So I highly suggest checking this one out. Wow, I'm, I did not know they covered this, so I, I'm definitely going to check it out. I could picture this being a great song for like a hair metal band to do. Yeah, it's great. Cool. All right, my 14, this is going to probably tick some people off because I know a lot of people do not like this version of this song. <laughs> Uh, over the years, it's really grown on me, and it's Johnny Be Good by Priest. And um, oh yeah, a lot Dang, of people, one I yeah, a lot about. of people can't stand it. You know, I mean, let's I'll face it, man. This original is from Chuck Berry, 1958. Even if you go back, Hendrix has done this uh, on some uh, some live albums and stuff. But um, I don't know something about it. I think it's I think it's the vocals. I think the way R- Rob goes, go go. <laughs> real high you know it just sounds so cool it's so you know the funny thing too is that sometimes you could say a lot of these we're going to say well this is very true to the original it's just an update you know this really is not true to the original the only thing that's true to it is probably the vocal melody of of the lyrics but i think like you can just tell that like uh kk and glenn really don't give a shit about chuck Berry because it's just they're just doing (laughs) you know what i mean it just sounds like 80s metal and uh, where, where the original is very much like early rock and roll, rockabilly. But um, I don't know, man. I, I didn't really care for it much either. Even as a kid, I kind of thought it was kind of goofy. But then, I yeah. don't know, years and years of just listening to Ram It Down and it would come on. And I'd be like, you know what, man? I, I like I like how his voice gets really high in spots. And uh, they, they, they do a great job with the guitars. But they just do it like straight up 80s metal style. So, um, yeah, that's where I got it. Yeah, I like this song. I uh, remember reading about how they turned down the Top Gun soundtrack, and so that's probably why they said yes to this one, thinking, uh-oh, we just we screwed that up. We could have been on a huge soundtrack. So they tried this, and I know the fans didn't really care for it, but I think it's a cool song. I think they did a great job. Yeah, it's, it's cool. I, I, I dig it. And uh, it's unfortunate that the movie bombed, probably. I don't think the movie did much. Yeah. This. So Top Gun would have been the better choice, but, you know, it is what it is. That's right. Yep. <laughs> All right, man, what's 13? Like 13, I got a little-known band called Shake City, and the song is called Game of War, and it's a Warrant song from 91. They're both from 91, uh, respectively, um, and it's on the Cherry Pie Expanded version that you could listen to, and... It's the Shake City album that came out in 91. Now, they're both obviously 80s strip bands, and this singer could pass for Janie Lane's clone. Um, slightly less of a talent, but, you know, just like many are. Very similar singing styles, but um, both the Warrant and the Shake City versions are killer. I really can't choose which I like more. Um, they're about equally produced, and they don't vary very much from one another, 
But uh, so Shake City is a really cool band that came out. Those those little known, and they they released an album in like 2009, finally of all their early 90s stuff. So uh, check it out. It's um, yeah, like I said, it's a coin flip on on whose version is better, Warrants or Shake Cities. But yeah, still both good. Check it out. That's cool. And you always you brought up a good uh, point that made me think about something. Is that that's obviously not a well known Warrant tune. And I always think it. I think it would be cool if more people did that kind of stuff because I've always thought that about like the Kiss demos. There's a lot of Kiss demos that didn't become real songs, and I always thought it'd be so great if somebody went in and like took those songs and revamped them and made like with good quality and good production, and maybe try to realize like Kiss's real idea for the song. I always thought a great album would be called One Man's Junk. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like this is the, oh, crap, yeah. the crap we didn't use, but then somebody takes it and like you know runs with it and, and, and makes it better or something. But I like that. That's cool that it was like a kind of a throwaway tune by Warren that they and they covered it. So, well, it's really no different than kind of like what we said with Toast of the Town. That obviously somebody didn't think that was good enough to be on Too Fast for Love. So, um, it's kind of cool that yeah. you know, Pretty Boy Floyd took it and, and ran with it. But um, yeah, so just a thought. Do you know that song? You, you ever heard that Warren? No, song? I'm gonna have to go check it out. It's on the Cherry Pie like remaster or, or, edit, or yeah, deluxe. Okay. Yeah, and then. Um, there's another one called The Power, I think. It's like the two that they kind of threw away, but they're both obviously pretty killer, so Sweet. check those out. Oh, All right, man, I'm going to go with 13. I'm going to go Please Don't Leave Me by uh, Pretty Maids. I really uh. love this song. And I didn't know. I always thought it was Thin Lizzy that 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 they covered. I think I read that before, but it's not. It's actually it was John Sykes' 1982 solo album, and he enlisted Phil Lynott to sing on it. So it feels like Thin Lizzy, but um, it's actually from a John Sykes solo album. So I did not know that. That's something uh, that I learned. If you listen to him. Uh, so I went back. I never heard that the original version until we were thinking about doing this episode, and it sounds kind of similar. The only thing is the chorus. They, they, uh, Phil sings the chorus low in the original, and the the cover is high. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, mm-hmm. Ronnie does it. it the singer's Ronnie, right? Atkins from Pretty Maids, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's he right. Sing, yeah, he sings that pretty high. And it, it's really cool. And I think what's hard is, you know, once you've heard that version first and then you listen to the original and you're like, man, why isn't he, I want to hear that high voice in the chorus. But, oh, yeah. But I, I think it's pretty cool. I mean, Phil Lina has got an awesome, just that smooth, cool voice, you know. So it is it is good. The original is good. But um, yeah, I, I dig I dig what Pretty Maids did. I think that's just a really it, – oh, it's just a great song overall. Just a great song. See, this is great. I'm so glad you're bringing these up because – this is every, everything so far I'm super familiar with, but there's so much to choose from, and either this escaped me or it's on an honorable mention, so that's a great choice. Nice, and then I didn't mention, so they're 10 years apart, so that's, they uh, pretty much did it in 92, and uh, Sykes did it in 82, so... Yeah, I did notice it was like a ten or twenty year period. Generally, it's like the pinpoint exactly the time period. Yeah, yeah, you t- yeah. Most of these, that's what it comes down to. All right, man, twelve. Number twelve, a song we talked about just recently in the Scorpions podcast. I'm doing "I Can't Explain" by the Who from Ooh. 1965. Nice. And it appeared on the Scorpions' Best of Rockers and Ballads in '89. So this is a just perfect cover. I think uh, this is such an updated, fun song for a band with such success at the time. They just kind of they probably just wanted to record what they want and have a good time doing it, and they really didn't have any any fear of failing. To be honest, at that right. point, because they were so big, you know. Um, but it's just, like I said, it's a really cool version. It was a standout on that album when I bought it. This was like one of the first Scorpions albums that I bought. So mm-hmm. I really got to learn these guys from this album. And I always assumed it was their song until my dad pointed it out, which was kind of classic. But, um, it's, you know, the original is just kind of a status quo 60s, chimey, yep. you know, the, the no distortion thing. But, yeah, they did, a, they did a, such a cool, updated job of this song. I, it made me a big fan of it. I love this tune. It may show up on my list. It may not. Ah, <laughs> I thought it might. <laughs> All right. 
my number 12. And I'm going to, a spoiler alert, Wasp comes up on my list three times. <laughs> three times, Holy Wasp. Morning. Because Wasp just do a great job with these covers. Mississippi Queen. Uh, so the first one that I'm going to mention is Mississippi Queen. So Mississippi Queen came out in 1970 from Mountain. But Wasp, I, I want to say, I don't think, this is not an official release. It was, I might have been a B-side at one point. Then it was on some Animal Live EP that they put out in the later 80s. And then I think it came and showed its face again, like on a, a deluxe version of The Last Command or something like that. So I could be wrong, but I heard it first on the Animal Live uh, EP that came out in the, in the later 80s. I just, I love it, man. It, what was it? I never heard it before. I, I never heard of Mountain back when I was a kid. I, you know, I was, I was a Wasp guy. So the Wasp version was the first version I ever heard. And it's just, it's a great tune. Blackie's voice sounds awesome. I think that's what kind of, kind of makes all the covers that he does is just the attack. You know, in his vocals. But when you listen to some of these guys, and we'll mention some of the other ones as we get to the other Wasp covers, you can kind of see where his he wears his influences on his sleeve. And if you listen to the way Leslie West sings this, it ain't that far off from the way Blackie sings it. He's got a pretty gnarly, mm -hmm. raspy voice. So a lot of this, you know, when you associate Blackie, you know, with an 80s guy and all that stuff, of course, that's when he came out. But his influences, you can tell, are, uh, you know, deep in the 70s, the late 60s and early 70s. So, yeah, I love Mississippi Queen. It's just a cool song. And my kids got into this song later uh, when it came on Guitar Hero. So, like, my, my kids are big fans oh. of the mountain version from Guitar Hero. But I always knew it as... It first, me hearing it first was from Wasp. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I don't think I've ever heard the Wasp version yeah, of it. It's wicked good. Good. All cool. right. Levin. I got one that also may show up on your list. I got Britney Fox, Goodbye to Jane. Nice. I got the 1972 Slade cover. Slade. And it was on, yep, yeah, it was on their uh, debut in 88. Uh, you know, another Slade cover. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> uh, the Magic Band, which all bands cover. I know, um, right? But I, I love this song. It's, it's very different, and it definitely fits Dizzy Dean's voice really well. And the background vocals are really strong. I really like that kind of cool slide guitar they have, like that, that twangy, glammy stuff they bring into it. But um, it's just, it's very different for this for their debut, but it's also different for a glam band to do. They, but Britney Fox wasn't, you know, they were very like uh, hard rock, 70s rock yep. roots on that album, which, you know, yeah. they fully admit, but it, it worked really well. Um, so this is a different song, but it, it was a, an epic debut so yeah i really like a, i've always this always been a standout on this album yeah it's a very cool song and and i started to think about it even more after i talked with michael kelly smith because he thought that this should have been a single he thinks that this could have mm -hmm. pushed the album you know to a higher level of success uh and, and once again i don't know why everybody wanted to redo slade songs it could it probably was because of quiet riot <laughs> but, but you know i think everybody was uh a lot of these guys were fans of slade so that's probably where a lot of it came from but that's a great pick yeah yeah all right another spoiler this band shows up two times on the list no matter what and i'm gonna go with 11 no matter what by Lillian Axe. This was on uh, 1992's Poetic Justice. It's by uh, Badfinger from 1970. So good, good stretch between it. It honestly doesn't sound that much different. If you listen to the the original version, it's it really the difference is the updated production, and I think the main difference is really is Ron Taylor, in my opinion, is a better singer than than the guy in Badfinger. I don't even yeah. know what his name is, but um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty it, overall. It, they're not taking it in some crazy ass direction where you can't recognize the song. Uh, I don't think really any of the ones on my list that I can think of. Well, maybe Johnny B. Good. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Johnny B. Good is seriously different than yeah. the original. But um, other than that, it's you know it's it's pretty close. But, yeah, I think that's a really great song. It's such a catchy song. And if I'm ever, like, in a store and I hear the original, I love it because yeah. I, because it's just a great, catchy tune. But, of course, heard Lillian Axe first. And with the better production and Ron's voice, it's, it's, it's the superior one in my book. 
Oh yeah, I love the song, and this is this is the Lillian album that I was most familiar with for a lot of years because that's the only one I can get a hold of, <laughs> get a hold of because you know everything else is, was uh, out of print. So yep. I was quite familiar with this and still really like it. Yeah, and they released it as a single, but it didn't do anything. Of course, <laughs> <laughs> it was '92. They had no shot. Uh, exactly. Uh, number ten. Okay, 10. So, you know, all these, my entire list, it goes without saying that I I prefer the updated version we're talking about. But this is is the sole song that I actually prefer the original. And I'll tell you what it is. I got Shark Island doing the chain off of their Law of the Order 1989 album that was originally recorded by Fleetwood Mac in 1977. Oh. So, you know, it's a bold statement on, you know, the 80s glam metal cast, but I believe I prefer a Fleetwood Mac song yeah. <laughs> over this really, really good album and this really good band. This is a very underrated album. I, I really like it. But I don't know what it is. It's like this is one of those songs where it's not my typical hard rock taste, but they did a really good job originally. Mm-hmm. Now, this one, they really beef it up a bit and they they add some big time bottom end and some some bass and drums that aren't aren't in the original but for some reason i like the original more now i'm not trying to take away from this because I, it's, it's number 10 on the list i still really like their their version of it but like i said some of these most all, all of these i prefer the new version this one i happen to prefer the old but this is just a this is an outlier it's still on the list. Well, and, uh, are you familiar with this album, Barry? Uh, yeah, and I completely forgot that they covered this song, and I'm glad that you brought yeah. it up because now, I, as you said it, I remember them doing it, but I haven't. I, like I said, I don't listen to this album on a regular basis, so I got to go back and listen to it. But of course, the original, you know, is very fresh in my mind. This um, kind of got popular again. It was in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. And I see. you know, I go with a lot of things that like my kids get back. You know, when they when it comes back around because of them, then I hear it. So you know, this song gets listened to a lot in the car. And one thing I noticed, I don't know, it, it's I don't know if it's been it's been remastered, obviously, in the modern era. It's got so, the original version. It's it's so crisp. It sounds like everything oh, yeah. is so clear, and the harmonies are so great. It's just an interesting tune in general. And uh, yeah, so I've got to go back and see what Shark Island uh, did to it again. But yeah, I can't imagine that you're going to be able to compete with the Fleetwood Mac one. No way. Yeah, and sometimes you can't screw with an original that was so huge. You yeah. know, like like you said, the the uh, one man's trash thing. That that's a that's a really good point. And a lot of these songs fit that mold. They weren't like huge hits for the original band. Right. This one obviously was huge for the original band, and you almost shouldn't have screwed with it. Right. Well, like I said, they did a good job, but. I don't think anybody's going to top it. <laughs> no, no. Number 10 is where I put I Can't Explain. I don't really have much to add. I mean, this was a pop. It was really a poppy tune by The Who. And yeah. Who is going to come up again? I love doing these spoilers on my list. But, you know, The Who kind of did the same kind of things that the Rolling Stones and the Beatles went through. They started their career very poppy, and then they got a little bit more heavier, experimental, whatever you wanted to call it. And this this song is very poppy, and I guess what you can, but it's got a great melody. You, you know, you, obviously, if you listen to Scorpions one, it, it, it wouldn't be anything without the cool melody that's in it. And if you listen to both versions, it's just like taking a song and presenting it the right way for that era. So when you listen yes. to this, yeah, you listen yep. to the '60s one, it's it's played and produced just like something should be done in the '60s. And when you listen to the Scorps. They're doing it. You can hear that, like the stuff they do with the guitar in it, is just total eighties. It almost reminds me of yeah. also what they did with Johnny B. Good. So it's like they kind of discarded anything that was old about it and, and gave it the modern production, the modern modern guitar style, and everything that you would do. But it, you know, a great song's a great song, and uh, that's it's a catchy, fun song. So good point about how it was. Right for the era originally, and right for the era when it was rebooted. So, yeah, yeah good point. All right, number nine. 
Number nine, Bangalore Choir, Angel in Black, which is their autograph original from the cutting room floor of their late 80s stuff when autograph kind of fizzled out after loud and clear, which is so weird, by the way, because they were so high with their you know mid-80s stuff, and then they just kind of fizzled out, which is weird. But anyway, um, so this was a song written by Steve Punkett, that singer, and uh, Bangalore Choir, uh, David Reese is the lead singer. Um, they kicked off their um, really good 91 debut called On Target with this song. And I actually really do prefer this version over the autograph version, even though I'm a big autograph fan. Uh, Bangalore Choir just does it with a little bit more balls and some more guitar that's kind of layered in there. So um, really cool song to kick off an album because it, it all comes in together kind of like, uh, was it Everyone's a Star on... on uh, mm. TNT's album where it just kind of like everything happens at once just bingo like full bore right away from second one so uh, really good debut uh, by Bangalore Choir well I really like this song and I didn't know it was a cover so thanks for enlightening oh. me about that I, I, I think this is like my, one of my favorite tunes by them and I did not know it was a cover so when you say it was on the cutting room floor did it make an official autograph album or no it did, but it made an album later in the uh, late 90s. But it says oh. clearly that this was written for what would have been an autograph album in like 89 or 90. Um, okay. But they gave, they, so they recorded it in the late 80s, didn't release it until uh, I think like 97 was missing pieces. Oh, okay. That's yeah, awesome, man. Yeah. Good. See, I love I love the '80s glam metal cast. Even though I'm the host, I love it. I, I even I learned something on this show. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was it was borderline because there are a few that I wanted to put on that were like covers in reverse. Like they basically someone wrote a song for another band, and the, that band put it out. And then later down the line, the original band recorded it and also put it out. Yeah. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, and like I wanted to add a few of those, but it wasn't a true cover. It was just songwriting, um, you know, just yeah. skills. So anyway, this was nearly that. But since it was clearly stated, like Autograph wrote it, recorded it, would have had in 89, didn't have an album, boom, released it later in like 97. So it's still qualified. <laughs> Sweet, man. That's, that's great information. Number nine. It's going to be Because the Night uh, by Keel. 1986 is The Final Frontier. Uh, this was a single, uh -huh. and they were, you know, shooting for the fences. I don't think it took off the way they wanted it to. But when you go back and listen to it, it's it's really cool. It, it's it's a great catchy song. It was originally done in 1978 by Patti Smith. Now I had never mm -hmm. heard her version before. I went back and listened to it. Now here's the interesting thing: <clears throat> a lot of people know there's ties to Springsteen with this. So Springsteen co-wrote the song with Patti Patti Smith. And oh. or maybe she's Patty Smythe. No, she's Patty Smith. Patty Smythe is the one who's the warrior, I think, right? I see. <laughs> okay, yeah. I don't know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Anyways, Patty yeah, so Springsteen co wrote this with her. And if you look at some of the live albums of Springsteen, you'll hear Because of the Night with him doing it. Uh the difference okay, so there, it's you know, once again, it's the same the melody's there, it's not that different. Uh it's more of like a art rock with Patty Smith's it, it like with piano and stuff like that. And of Keel, of course, you know, Keel's got their big vocals and, and their 80s guitar. So it's kind of that same thing we keep saying. It's the same song. It's the same melody. It's just, you know, it's more of like an artsy rock presentation versus an 80s glam metal presentation. But uh, a great tune. A lot of, if you, man, you look this song up and everybody, their brother's done this song. 10,000 Maniacs and you name it. It's not a song that's traditionally tied with metal. So it's kind of funny that keel you know went for it. i don't know if this was gene simmons idea because he produced this album i don't know um but you know it, it's it's a cool version it's a good song and keel have actually quite a few covers if you if you bounce around and, and find different things keel did uh rock and roll outlaw which was rose tattoo they did oh. um fool for a pretty face uh which i think is humble pie so you know they they've dabbled in some covers oh and they do um Let's spend the night together. 
uh, by the Rolling Stones. So, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, Keel ones out there, but I think this one's the, their strongest cover. Yeah, dude, this one, it's it's odd because you mentioned, um, I was just, I was thinking about Autograph but since we're on the topic, and the fall from grace that Keel and Autograph experienced from the highs of 1984 and 5 yep. to opening for Van Halen and Bon Jovi, respectively, then to this, and like, we're, they, they had to like put out this song as an attempt to uh, to kind of get it back, but it was only like three years later. It's just so weird how it all happened to mm-hmm. bands like this, where they the, the fall from grace. You know, you could even sprinkle some Twisted Sister in there when it comes to the fall from grace. It's just so odd how totally. it totally quite right too. Bands, Major, yes. Oh God, yes. So, but I'll admit, this song I always turn it off. I don't know what it is about the song, but every time it comes on, like either videos or or um, you know, radio, you know, XM or something, I just like I, it's never clicked with me. I felt like they were trying a little too hard, and I, I should probably give it another shot with a, a more mature ear. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I never the song never clicked with me. Yeah, I mean it. It's kind of goofy because like t- t- because the night belongs to lovers. I mean it's kind of cheesy for like. For 80s metal, but I think one cool thing I do like about it a lot is that they do the chug, and you know, it's, you know, it's, got, uh-huh. it's got a lot of cool aspects to it. I mean, I do like it, yeah. But I can see where you're coming. Lyrically, it might be like, you know, if you're like a metal guy, you might be like, huh, you know. So <laughs> I'll check it out again. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Number eight, I got Motley Crue teaser. So nice. this was the uh, yeah the Tommy Bolin nineteen seventy five original, and the crew recorded it on that Stairway to Heaven, Highway to Hell yep. uh, charity yep. album in eighty nine, and then it also appeared on uh, Decade of Decadence in ninety one. So um, it was it always kind of like bordered on seventies glam, like a bit much for me, but now I really like it, and it grew on me over the years, and. Of the the new songs on Decade, um, I'm a big fan of Angela. I really like Rock and Roll Junkie, and then this one. So, uh, but this is like right in Vince's wheelhouse. It's like the perfect Vince Neil song to sing, and it doesn't get much more Vince than that. But um, I watched a video on YouTube when I was kind of researching this, and there's a really cool live performance when Randy Castillo's playing with them. Mm. And uh, yeah, check it out. It, and at the time, you thought Vince was kind of shot and, and like looking the way he was, but he wasn't. Like I think it's from '99 or two. No, well maybe '99 or 2000. Whatever Castillo was in the band, yeah. 2000 or something 2000. like that. But Vince actually looks pretty cool still. <laughs> nice. And you know, even then, when I thought that he was kind of getting over the hill. But anyway, um, I almost did Helter Skelter, but. I didn't, and it's because so many other bands covered it, mm-hmm. and it's it's so killer. Like, yeah, I well, you know I could have gone either way, but I did choose Teaser just because I have my love for the uh, Decade album. So yeah, I threw it on there. <laughs> yeah, Crew's got a lot of uh, covers. You know, Teaser is a great one. I've always hated them doing Anarchy in the UK. Just doesn't work for mm-hmm. me. Like Megadeth doing it sounds great. Crew, no, sorry, it just doesn't work. No, nope. uh, I've never been know, a fan either. White Punk's on Dope, I think, is pretty cool. Off of, I will, you know, that would probably be an honorable mention somewhere along the line. But they do a lot of covers. And uh, you know you're 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 a fool, Ryan. You should have put smoking in the boys' room. It's the best. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Dude, best. I like that song. You know, I actually, I'm I'm so far from thinking that's a cover because it's such a Motley Crue staple. Yep. I, I didn't even think of it. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to choose Helter Skelter, Jailhouse Rock. Oh, Jailhouse Jesus. Rock. Yeah, I forgot about that one. Yep. You there know, we go. Tons of also them. great. So tons of. Them. All right, my number eight. Back to my mother. Wasp returns with The Real Me, 1989. And uh, what's different, so this is The Who again, and I forgot to write down what year it was by The Who, but I want to say it's like 70 or 71. So this is at the point where Who is more like hard rock, you know, a little bit more experimental. And if you listen to these, go back and listen to, because I, I think this was a fairly big hit for Wasp, because Wasp really never had many hits, but I feel like this at least was a dial MTV hit. This was on quite a bit uh, back in 89. Yeah. This kicked off the Headless Children album, and 
if you and go this back, has got that really cool bass intro, right? Yeah, it's got a lot of cool bass on it. And if you listen okay, to the Who's yeah. version, it ain't that much different. That's just it's really an updated production, but theirs is still pretty rocking and pretty heavy. So yeah, the, the Who version is cool. Heard the Wasp version first, of course. You know what I mean. I wasn't I course, wasn't alive yeah. when the uh, the other one came out, but uh, I love Headless Children. Blackie owns it. This one definitely. I don't think him and Daughtry have a ton in common vocally, and uh, yeah, he just makes the song his own. It's awesome. Well. I must admit, I didn't know it was a cover. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're getting, you're getting schooled. Uh, I really like this song by Wasp, so now I know. That's cool. All right, number seven. I got David Lee, California Girls. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. He, now you want to talk about a guy that's done some covers. Holy shit. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, Beach Boys, 1965. On the Crazy from the Heat album in 1985. And, you know, only David Lee could take a collection of songs like Just a Gigolo and Easy Street and all those and make them cool in 1985. And uh, the video was great. The album cover's epic. And he struck first on the Van Halen split, you know? So I got to give him some credit. But he just, like, put that rock touch on his videos, especially at the time. Um, in this era, and it just made it so bright and colorful and artistic and, you know, kind of nuts. Yep. But at this point, they're cool, unlike his really out there videos he's doing nowadays he's putting out. But back then, he made it awesome. Nice. All right, number seven. Song was "Set Me Free" by Vince Neil, originally done oh, in '74 yeah. by uh, The Sweet. And I, I've gone back a few times. I've heard this outside of, of Vince's album, and I've went back and I've listened to it a few times. I really like the singer in The Sweet's voice because it's it's a real different voice. It's it's a little bit more raspier, so it, so it definitely comes off a lot different. But his voice is really cool. But anyways, you ain't touching the musicianship on the Vince Neil version. Steve Stevens, Vicky Fox, yeah, they're crushing it, man. It sounds really good. And you and you know me, you and me, we're big Vince heads. We love Vince, and yeah. he sounds great on this album. You know, talking some sick. Great production by Ted Templeton in 1993. So, set me free. Kick-ass tune. Yeah, I remember you preached it when I, uh, we, you and I both put it on our 93 podcast. We yep. have Vince on there that's yep. exposed. Oh, yeah. And you had brought the song up as one that you really like. Um, so, again, totally forgot about it. So, I'm glad you brought it up. It's just too many, man. There's too many. All right, what's, what's I six? Know, great. Okay, number six, I got my boys in House of Lords doing Can't Find My Way Home off their absolute 11 out of 10 1990 Sahara album. Nice. Originally recorded by Steve Winwood when he was in the band Blind Faith, which also had uh, Eric Clapton and uh, Ginger Baker from Cream. So, um, you know, the original is like your 60s typical, almost like folk music. Um, The House of Lords... House of Lords version is just huge, talented, raspy voiced, and this killer momentum builder of a song. Um, the video is really cool. It's uh, outdoor at night, and there's there's a couple, there's two killer '80s music videos that really stand out, and that's the the nighttime outdoor setup or the the desert setting, like you know, like wasps. Uh, what, uh, what Wild Child in yeah. the desert, right? Yep. Europe. Yeah, you got Steelheart doing um, Angel Eyes. Think about that desert background. Yep. It's always so killer. Anyway, <laughs> um, but this is just a great song, and um, my dad gave it the seal of approval, and he uh, he said he recalled it from his uh, the bad old days. Nice. So um, yeah, that was that was pretty good. That's when I realized it was a cover when my my dad overheard me playing it years <laughs> ago. So yeah, but uh, really cool song. It's much different than the original. This one definitely builds and becomes just that 80s rock, huge drums and guitar thing. So, yeah, check it out, especially the video. Nice, nice pick. All right, number six. Thanks. And you 
talk about Roth. I'm going to talk about him. Here's where I'm going to put Shy Boy. And, you know, this was originally by Talis uh, and was recorded, I think, in 82. Now, you, I don't know, man. I couldn't find much about Talis. I know it was Billy Sheehan's uh, first band. I don't know if this ever was even on an official release. I, I could be wrong. I was looking up one of their albums and I didn't see it on it. I did find the album, the, the song on YouTube. And it, it obviously sounds better, but it, it's not far off. If you listen to the original version, it's not far off. And whoever sings that for Talis kind of has a Roth vibe. It almost reminds me of Roth. But with Roth actually on it, updated production, and Steve Vai, it is the superior version. But I don't really understand, you know, like why this was on there. I know because it wasn't a known song. Maybe it was just a song where Sheehan thought, like, man, we were trying to emulate Van Halen with this tune. Why don't we do this in our band? And, and you know, Roth jumped at it. I, I could not find anything. I couldn't find any interviews where they talked about why they did this track. But I love this track. And the other thing that I got to say is I feel kind of stupid now because I didn't touch any of the old Van Halen covers and i'm just gonna throw in now that i think some of those are just amazing you know i feel bad that i put on like ice cream man or uh big bad william is is, big bad bill is sweet william now i love those little corny old school songs like that so roth is just uh, an original and you know even when he did that's life when he takes these things he takes them to the next over the top level so kudos to david yeah well i'll pick up i'll pick up for you didn't put the Van Halen ones in a little later. Oh, okay. <laughs> I right. got you covered, man. Sweet, sweet. Uh, and, I, and I actually didn't know that Shy Boy was a cover. Oh, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, I've heard I like that song a lot, too. Yeah, I love it. It's probably the most Van Halen-ish sounding song on the album. And it's funny that it's, a, it's somebody else's oh, yeah. song. Weird. All right, number five. Yeah. Number five, uh, as predicted, I got to put a hardline song in here. So I got Hot Cherie from 1992. You got to have hardline, man. Clip. He's your boy. <laughs> I know. The kings of 92. So like you said earlier, these songs are covered over and over. And this song was covered like four times. I didn't even I didn't even know that. That's so um, originally it was a, a guy called Danny Spanos from 1983. The original like you said again earlier the melody's there you got to have it somewhere but it's just this twangy simple thing and it's i don't don't know how they mustered up the humongous 92 version from listening to this it's got to take a talented ear but um of all the covers like obviously i favor hardline much more than many other bands but this rendition is just huge and perfect like the rest of the album and i don't remember when i discovered that this song was a cover but it did shock me it was one of those songs where you go wait what like they they made this song their own man like how could this be anyone else's but the guys in hardline and i actually looked back and um johnny gioli's first band brunette also did a version of it that was also way less cool so Hmm. um yeah so you know it just kept getting better and better i don't know what the addition was uh, on double eclipse but Man, I'm glad they did it. <laughs> yeah, I I read in later years, found out that it was a cover, and I was surprised too because it just sounds so, you know, late '80s, early '90s, um, you know, hair metal. So it's kind of weird, totally. You know that yeah. that, that was the, the case, but you know, yeah, it, it is it is what it is. Uh, yeah, number five. Here's where I put Fire and Rain uh, by Badlands. They, they did it in 91. Oh. It was originally done by 1970 by James Taylor. And I would say this is quite a bit different because James Taylor is more of a folky type of a rock guy. You know what I mean? And, and this is pretty chill, sung in a lower register. And I think the way that Badlands do it... It's more of what it sounds like if it could have been done by Led Zeppelin or Bad Company. You know what I mean? It's it's a lot more of that seventies hard rock vibe, and the the higher singing and it's so emotional. So even though like Ray Gillen didn't write the song, I feel like he put his soul into the singing. It's 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 really emotional. And the one last thing I'll say about it is that um, when I had Greg Chase on, on you know I don't know this album and song came up, and he said that. I think when James Taylor got wind that they wanted to cover it, he kind of wrote them a letter and asked them not to do it. And then they said, oh, just, 
just to piss them off, they did it anyway. So I'm glad they did because I, I it's a really great rendition and there's a lot of heart and soul into it and uh and i think james taylor's cool I, my parents used to listen to james taylor and he's a great songwriter but for me that's m- more my speed the way it's done uh by badlands well i'm glad that they they said no and just uh and did it anyway because i was invited to a, a james taylor concert mm-hmm. it was totally free and dude it was the most Boring, horrible. <laughs> I found nothing entertaining about it. I left after like six songs. Yeah. God, I hated it. So, hey, I'm glad that they did that. <laughs> <laughs> he's more, he's more of a chill, low key guy. You got to be in the mood for it, I guess. Uh, yeah, I definitely wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, no. All right, what do you got for four? Four, Billy Idol doing Money Money. Nice. Yeah, so Tommy James and the Shondells from 1968 to the original. Uh, Billy did it on his 81 EP, Don't Stop. So this was released right before the uh, the first big album. Um, but then he released it again in the Vital Idol album. Mm-hmm. And the 87 version and video went to number one. So it's Billy's only um, number one hit. But... Um, such a cool video and just perfect for Billy at the time. He's just so um, very sexual, if you will, yeah. <laughs> for Billy Idol. And uh, he just that was kind of he was he was selling that at the time. And uh, the female backup singers were just eating it up. And Billy's kind of pushing the envelope. I, I don't think it would pass in the uh, in the cancel era that we're in now. <laughs> but hey, that's why the '80s were so killer. Um, <laughs> I love the entire remix album, this Vital Idol album. So. Uh, Really good versions, and this is one of those really standout tunes that you, you hear it a lot, and you hear it you know frequently on the radio and live and stuff. But it, it never gets old for me. So it was a perfect song for a guy like Billy Idol to cover and update. Yeah, yeah he's you know that that's a huge song for him, and, and he's got that old rocker vibe in him, anyways. Even though he's like a punk rocker, he's got that old rocker vibe too. And, uh, yeah, and, and you know, it ain't far off from the original. Once you hear the original, you're like, it, it's got a lot of the same elements, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> number four is where Lillian Axe returns with My Number from 1989's Love and War. And my number was originally by Girl in 1980. And if you know Girl, oh. it's Phil Lewis from L.A. Guns and Phil Collin from Def Leppard. And I've, I've gone back and I've checked this out. Girl also covers Do You Love Me by Kiss. Although, okay, so this is, no, this is Girl doing a cover, and now Lillian X is doing a cover of Girl, so, okay, that, no, so that's not really even relevant, but anyways, um, <laughs> the hard part is, you know, if you go back to listen to a lot of rock from 1980, you know, it, it's not as beefed up as the later 80s and the early 90s, so, you know, this is more, it, it's it's cool, but it's not super heavy, and it's it's not as sleazy, I think, as, as the way it sounds, it, it just told it's just total L.A. sleaze metal, the way that Lillian X does it and the funny thing is about it is if when you listen to the love and war album there's not a lot of stuff like this on it love and war is actually a pretty experimental album for the most part there's a couple tracks that are that fall into this kind of hair sleaze metal category but it, it, the way they do the guitar and everything steve blaze just owns the guitar on this and you know of course ron taylor's voice is so killer i love i love phil's voice too but it's just phil i like phil better in la guns that's when he was in his full-on sleaze metal mode. yeah and uh girls cool you know they were probably way ahead of their time and that was the problem with them but my number is such a cool song and that's another one you listen to that you'd have no idea it's a cover you'd have no idea that it came out almost 10 years before their version so great tune well uh, i feel terrible because i love that lillian song I obviously love both the Phil's and Girl, and I have the Girl stuff. I didn't know. How did I miss you this should, all these years? I, now, I'm I super I, disappointed in you, man. You you love L.A. Guns. You love Phil Collin from Death Love. You should have known this. Shame on you. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just – I, I, I got to hang up. <laughs> <laughs> but, see, they fooled you. Lillian X fooled you to make you think it was their song because they did it so good. They, you had no idea. 
seriously, dude. Gosh. Okay, now I gotta listen to the original again. <laughs> All right, number three. All right, I got Tesla doing Little Susie. Nice. From the 1986 epic Mechanical Resonance album. So uh, the band, this is one of the bigger discrepancies in the original to the updated version. So it's only five years later. It's a new wave band called PhD from 1981. And dude, like, come on, a new wave song they made into like a cool hard acoustic song like wow. anyway it's super different you, you know the melody's there you know it's the song but it's like you know it's got this keyboard lady thing the singer obviously is much different in his styles but it's just so cool to hear someone like metalizing a song like this even though it was you know more of a acoustic driven hard rock song but they plugged it in a little bit um but yeah like like i said the the keyboards there the the phrasing is a little bit different, but I'm like a big sucker for these like uh, electric acoustic songs like Raise Your Hands to Rock, uh, Want a Dead or Alive. Um, Unruly Child's got a really good one called um, Let's Talk About Love. But this one may top the list of those kind of hard acoustic songs. And it's just a great live song and a, and a song I, I literally never turn this one off. I, I, I can listen to this song every time it's on the radio. So uh, Little Susie's in my top five tesla and definitely definitely a, a cool cover can't believe they pulled this one off <laughs> dude you should have had signs up there no I'm <laughs> oh come on <laughs> no, no i'm kidding so i are you got me i had no idea this was a cover this just totally feels like one of their songs i so i'm kind of surprised oh. i gotta go back and listen to the original no idea had no idea yeah you're gonna trip dude like a, a new wave song i made it they pulled it off though <laughs> nice all right my number three you mentioned but you don't have it on your list And uh, oh. Helter Skelter, so from Crew, man, uh, 1983. Nice. Now, if you have not heard the Beatles version, the Beatles version is pretty freaking heavy. Yes, it is. And I would say that overall, it's very, it's probably more raw than than the Crew version. The Crew version is pretty produced, but the, the the Beatles version is really gnarly and nasty. And I think they're playing so hard, and they're not used to it. If you listen to the end of the song, uh, Ringo goes, "I got blisters on me fingers." You know, what I mean? so, so oh yeah, they're, that's that they're one. playing a little too hard for for their uh their, their them themselves. But the cool thing that I really like, there's a couple elements that really make the Crew one. Uh, one is the groovy chug. That is not in the Beatles one. Like the, dun, 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 you know, it's not in the, it's not in the Beatles. The Beatles are just kind of like going sick, you know. They're not, but they don't have a groove at all. So the crew added a groove, which is kind of weird that 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 would have the groove and not the other one. Uh, and I think the coolest thing probably that makes it fit was shout at the devil because. You know, I don't know the full story, but I know there's a Charles Manson reference. Like, he listened to this before he committed those murders. So now here's Motley Crue doing it on this demonic album. You know, so it kind of like it all comes together. It kind of fits on an album uh, like Shout at the Devil. But, you know, Vince sounds great, too, on it. And he adds a little bit of his own flair on there. So, yeah, just a lot of cool elements that make that, for me, one of their coolest covers. Yeah, this is a lot like, uh, for me, the House of Lords can't find my way. Um, there was a, an, a, uh, like an acoustic band playing at a winery my wife used to work at, and they, they played Can't Find My Way Home, and they actually played like a real mellow version of, of this. And I said, hey, you guys know that there's a couple bands out there that did much more killer versions of this? And I played it for them, and they were like appalled. And I'm like, oh, come on. But, dude, I mean... You got, I think, what Aerosmith and U2, I know, are like the big, big guys that did uh, covers of this as okay. well. And, dude, this is just one of those songs on Shout that, like, it, it fits right in with the rest, dude. You can't really knock this song because it's a cover. You know what I mean? Like, yep. it fits so well on this album. And I knew this one before I knew the Beatles one, you know? <laughs> and same, like, same. It, just, just like you with your Wasp st yep. stuff. But, um... Yeah, I mean, I, I, you can't knock this one. Like I said, it was a, it was neck and neck with Teaser or this one, and I, I went with Teaser, but uh, I was hoping you'd do this one. <laughs> yeah, all right. Number I two. I sometimes said, babe, need something to keep you cool. 
I'm now summertime zip bay. Okay, here's where I got your Van Halen. I picked you up and I got ice cream, man. Yeah, ice it's so good, man. Day. What a fail on good. my part. You you bailed me out. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no problem. So it it appeared on Van Halen one, um, but this is a a guy named John Brim, and he's a, a 50s blues player. And you know, just like classic David Lee Roth, he would he would choose this. You know yep. what I mean? It's just yep. like California Girls. Roth knew that there's some old school blues guy out there, and he took this and said, "Oh, this is um, you know, I'll, I'll sexualize this song yep. and make it very David Lee." And uh, what a cool momentum builder this song is! It just it just keeps going and going and going, and the kick in is amazing, and Eddie sounds killer on it, and. Roth does his deep vocals and dedicates one to the ladies and all that <laughs> good stuff. So, you know, so anyway, really, it's one of my one of my favorite Van Halen songs. And I never knew, not never, I didn't know for a long time that this was a cover. Now, and, uh, I've never listened to the original, but I would have to assume that the beginning part is played somewhat straight to the original because it sounds like an old school song. And then they kind of fake you out and then they go pretty heavy as the song progresses. So I think that's a cool element of uh, the way they do this tune. Yeah, check it out. It, it's obviously just um, there's some like YouTube footage of like real grainy, um, just you know typical '50s kind of twangy stuff going on. But uh, you could definitely tell it's a song. It's pretty cool that they again like like many of these these guys had the ear to uh, adapt it to their current times. Yeah, so. that's awesome, man. Yeah, great call yeah. on that one. My number two is more of a dark horse oddball. Going with Love Potion number nine from Bo Nasty's <laughs> 1989 <laughs> debut. I, I love this song, and I, I think I've gotten more into it uh, over over time. So this song was originally done in 1959 by the Clovers, and when you listen to it, if, if you can just use your imagination, it almost sounds very similar to like the Monster Mash, like that kind of playing. You know, what I mean? <laughs> yeah. so it's like it's almost like a novelty, goofy song. And I think there was some uh, dude did another one. There's been British invasion bands that have done this song. Everybody and their brother has done this song. Um, it, it's it's cool, man. I think the thing is, is one thing that you never stray from is that catchy melody, and it's kind of funny too. Like when you know he talks about he, you know he started kissing everybody, he kissed the cop, and you know and all that kind of stuff. So you know, it's just kind of silly. Like it's just a silly fun song. But the major thing when when I just listened to it over the weekend, the biggest thing that came to mind. There's probably a couple reasons for this. Is I think Warrant should have did this song. I think this should have been on Warrant's uh. debut, and I think it would have been huge. Um, and and I, I think it's because of Bo Hill, because Bo Hill produced this, and he produced the the Warrant album. So I feel yeah. like there's something about this. I was like, man, you know what? You know why? To Ryan, it's because it's goofy like cherry pie. So that's why I was like, you know what? Yeah. This could have been the, the 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 precursor to cherry pie, the Love Potion number nine. So yeah, just a thought that popped in my head. I was like, I was getting Warrant vibes, and that's probably because of Bo Hill. But no matter what, if you don't know this song. Go check it out. Check out the Bone Nasty one because it's pretty heavy and funny and, and, and slick and sleazy. And it's got everything you're looking for. Great tune. Dude, so I had it on the list at like 13 or 14 and I kicked it to the honorable mentions. But I really like the Bone Nasty album. Yeah. Um, and this is the, uh, another one of those songs where you go, this um, a hard rock band is doing this shit? Like, right, yeah. But it worked, it, it worked it really works. well. And I, yeah, and it's the last song on the album, right? Yep. I, if yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, yeah, and dude, it, it's it's a really kick-ass song, and they they pulled it off really well. And I'm I'm stoked you put it on, but I'm also shocked you put it as high as number two. I love it. It's so great. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Good. All right, man. What's your number one? Okay. Number one, I'm going with one of my main men here. We've got Crocus, Stayed Awake All Night, off the Headhunter album from 1983. Yeah. And it's a BTO uh, cover, Back okay. in Overdrive, from 1973. But even the guys in BTO say the Crocus version is far superior. Really? Like I've, I've, 
Yeah, I've watched um, live videos where they are performing it and they say, you might know this song from the hard rock band Crocus, who did the, a, a much better version of it than we do. <laughs> and then they go on to play the, the their version of it. But this is just that early 70s kind of like weird kind of out there stuff. But again, I can't believe Crocus had the foresight to make it so killer because for years I had no idea that this was a cover um, before like kind of technology of just, you know, researching and figuring it out right away. Um, but this is a staple in the Crocus catalog. They, I mean, they had a best of called Stayed Awake All Night. Uh, they play it live every time. It's on every best of album. I mean, it's, it's a huge song for them and they made it really epic um it's a it's one of those songs I, I can never turn off and the vocal performance and the riffage is just amazing and again uh with uh, uh giving my my dad a little head nod here he loved this song when i first got into crocus because obviously uh i was yearning for more acdc so naturally i went to crocus and uh, he's a big ACDC guy, so when he heard this song, he said, okay, this is good shit, mm -hmm. and he would play the hell out of it. So uh, my dad loves it, and that's awesome in itself, and I've always loved this song, so that's my number one, hands down. Nice, man. And, you know, Crocus have done quite a few covers, you know, Ballroom Blitz and uh, School's Out come to mind. So, yeah, they're, they, yeah. They, they, like, they like their covers. Oh, they love them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, this is Wasp topping my list. Number one, I don't need no doctor. I love that song. Oh, yeah. That was so, to, you know, to, to paint the, the history of it, that was the first Wasp album I ever bought was Inside the Electric Circus. Had no idea it was a cover. Thought it was a great song. So now we yeah. got to take time now to figure out the, the strange and long history of this song. So... This song dates back to 1966, okay? And if anybody knows okay. the duo, the, the husband and wife duo, Ashford and Simpson, they sing solid, solid as a rock. You know, these guys. So um, <laughs> they were they were like Motown house writers, and they put out this song, you know, in the 60s. It didn't really do anything. Then Ray Charles did it a few years later, and I think it had moderate success. But I think where you're hearing the version that Wasp is doing is from 1971 by Humble Pie. So Humble uh, Pie yeah. is one of those ones where, you, you know, even though we missed the bolt probably on Humble Pie because of our age and everything, you know, they must be great. And when I've gone back and I've listened to it, it does sound pretty good. And, and, and the Humble Pie version and this are not that different. And, you know, if you go back to listen to Steve Marriott, how he sings – you can see again where Blackie Lawless, you know, pulls some influence from. So, so that's where I think this version comes from is them trying to emulate the Humble Pie version. And uh, but you know, for me, it was an early Wasp song. I I honestly would say probably to this day it's probably my favorite Wasp song because it's just one oh, of the wow. first tunes that I ever heard by them, and I always loved it. Thought it was cool and catchy. And uh, yeah, and, and Blackie's voice is killer on it. So yeah, I don't need no doctor. It's got a pretty wild history, but uh, it's always going to be a wasp tune for me. So yeah, that's cool. I, I like this wasp song. So uh, I'll, I'd like to look at the uh, originals and see how different they are. Yeah, definitely. Well, I know you got a few uh, honorables. What do you got? Yeah, dude. You know, I actually uh, I. Booted off uh, Winger Purple Haze for Scorpions. Yeah. And the completely 11th hour. And Purple Haze, uh, it's a weird one for me because I, I I really didn't like it. When I first got the Winger tape yeah. in like the late 90s, I was like, yeah, I'm a decade late. I was like, dude, this is horrible. And I, I remember like chucking it out the window. My buddy picked it up. Yeah. And he cranked it as Walkman. You know, he, this album's pretty cool, actually. And I'm like, okay, I'll check it out. <laughs> but this song really threw me off. I did yeah. not like it. Yeah. And I really didn't like... I Still, I don't like the fact that Winger put a cover on... They didn't need a cover. No. Let's just put it that way. No. You know, you know what I mean? Like, this album and this band are so killer and so perfect and strong. They didn't need to screw around with the cover. And if they were going to do it, 
I don't know why they chose Purple Haze. So it's no. I kind of have a love hate, and to be honest, I kind of I skip it every time I'm listening to this album. It's a skip for me. Yeah, it's a skip for me. I don't I don't like their, them doing it, but I actually knew it before. Uh, I heard Winger because yes. of like my dad and stuff, and and I like Jimi Hendrix a lot, but I just I don't know. You just don't. There's no reason to touch that. It's a pretty good tune, and, and and they just don't do anything interesting with it. So for me to this day, it's a skip. Yep, exactly the same way. And obviously, I knew the Jimmy version first. And again, like the Fleetwood version, you, you shouldn't really mess with it. Yeah. Um, I got I got uh, two that are kind of in the category, or, or three that are like they were kind of written for someone else, and then the original artist put it out later. So I couldn't really consider it, but. Uh, Helix did She's Too Tough, and it was a Def Leppard song. Uh, they put it out in, like, the mid-'80s, and then Def Leppard did their own version mm-hmm. on Retroactive, which is, like, one of my favorite Def Leppard songs. Uh, kind of the same thing Richard Marks wrote, Vixen, Edge of a Broken Heart. Yep. Um, London, or DePriest, however you want to call them, they did Hot Child in the City. Uh, this is where <laughs> yeah, I have... Uh, I remember Bo- that, yeah. Yeah, it's a good song. Uh, I got Bo Nasty here. On this uh, honorable mentions, and then I got I got Hurricane. I'm 18. Yep, yep. Here, um, Mr. Big, uh, Lucky This Time with Jeff Paris song, and then uh, Mama, we're all crazy now. Nice. But I do have three dishonorable mentions, <laughs> <laughs> and I got uh, Come on, Feel the Noise, Ballroom Blitz, and then I kind of put Purple Haze in there for Winger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, so. Uh, this this cover just came to me as I was reading the Wasp one, okay, or, or maybe okay. right before that, and and it's an epic fail on my part. Why did I not put Hair of the Dog by Brittany Fox on this list? I just completely uh. forgot about it. I really like it. I think his Dean's voice is just incredible on it with his screech. Their version smokes the Guns N' Roses version, and uh, it's pretty similar to the Nazareth one, so I can't really say that it yeah. kills it, but, you know, being a Britney Fox fan, so I'm a totally ashamed of myself. Um, so th- that that would be my 16, <laughs> out of, uh, just because right. I have nowhere else to go, because I've already made the list. But uh, So a couple other ones, uh, Spanish Castle Magic. Uh, by Ingve, it's on the Live in Leningrad. It's a pretty cool tune. Oh. It's it's Hendrix, but it's uh, Ingve and Joe Lynn doing it. Pretty cool. I also have I'm um, 18 on my list by um, by Hurricane. It's pretty cool. Uh-huh. It didn't make the list. Uh, I think the only reason they did it is because Bob Ezrin was Alice Cooper's producer and he produced Over the Edge. I think that's the only reason why that that happened. But uh, uh, I see. Bad Moon Rising by Leatherwolf, uh, CCR cover. That's pretty cool. Oh, uh, but it cool, didn't make yeah. the cut. I also mentioned Goodbye to Gene. I like it, but mm, it just didn't make it. Oddball one. I wanted to throw Kiss on here. Kiss Kiss has a couple issues though. What Kiss t- tends to do with covers, and they may just do this so they can make money. But they've redone songs, but they rewrite them to an extent. So then they get a songwriting credit. So if you look at oh boy. God gave rock and roll to you, they call it God gave rock and roll to you too by Argent. So like they've got a songwriting credit because they like rewrote parts of it. And then they also did Rock and Roll Hell on Creatures of the Night by BTO, but they also rewrote parts of that. So it's hard for me to put those as covers, so I just kind of stayed away from them. But one cool KISS cover, and I think probably the reason why it just didn't make the list because it's more modern, but it was on the Ramones tribute album, and they do Rock and Roll Radio, and it's so good. Oh. They totally own it. And you know, and it's a lot of trade-off vocals between Gene and Paul, which is uh, reminiscent of Old Kiss. One, I'm surprised that both of us did not put on because it's a really great song, but I think it's probably overplayed. Is Radar Love? Uh, it, that oh, Radar oh, Love nice. is cool, but you know, I, I'm kind of burnt out with it, so it didn't make my list. And then my final honorable would be Do Ya by Ace Frehley, and that was a uh, originally done by um, Electric Light Orchestra. Uh, yeah, there we go. So. Those are my those are my tunes. Another co- strange cover, which I just would like to mention, uh, and it, it, and then it kind of fits in what you were talking about. Is it really a cover? Is "Hide Your Heart" by Kiss because like Paul wrote it, then I think Robin Beck did it, and then Ace Frehley did it. So it's like I guess it's a cover to an extent, you know, because somebody did it. But I but it's all it's they all yeah. kind of came around around the same time, so it's kind of weird. Yeah. So you're telling me back to the Kiss songwriting thing? Yeah, that I could I could release a song called 
like Freeway to Hell and sing it exactly like ACDC but take songwriting credits? I, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The word freeway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you if you if you kind of took an element of their song and then just rewrote it to something of your own. Yeah, I guess so. That they've done it, man. They did it. They did it with those two songs. And uh, they they have songwriting credits on those along with the original writer, so it's Kiss, man. What can you do? Mm. <laughs> They've always got an angle. You know, like I've always thought, like, what if I just came up with a band called Kingsrike? Like, would I <laughs> would I get in trouble for that? <laughs> no, I don't think you would. I think you can get away with it. Yeah. All right, there we go. That's my new band. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, this was a good one. Uh, obviously, yeah. I think on a couple of these we educated each other hopefully the people who totally. listen to it will be educated and they might say wow i never knew that was a cover and then they might go back and check out the original band and then my last thing yeah. and this is a challenge to anybody who listens uh to the podcast if you could find somebody who covered a door song i was like why did a hair metal band never cover a door song because the doors were like the original la bad boys you know what i mean and i'm really oh, well, really kind of surprised that nobody did or maybe they did i just don't know it Billy did it. Um, Billy Idol did it on Charmed Life. He did, he did LA Woman. LA Woman, right. yes. Yeah, that's right. But I'm thinking if anybody would have... Somebody should have did a Doors tune back in the 80s. And I, and if they did, uh, I want yeah. somebody to let me know. But I, I couldn't find it, so... Yeah, good call. That would have been a good one. All right, brother. Always a pleasure. All right, yeah, thank you. That was awesome. Yeah, man. We'll talk soon. Well, that was great, talking our favorite covers. Hope you enjoyed it. Rock out!